And now we'll be time for a few questions and answers. Okay, Josephine, you are first with your hand up. Ask to unmute, ask to unmute. I cannot. I got it. Yeah, 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 great. No, you muted yourself again. <laughs> <laughs> now better. Actually, I wanted to, well, two things. One, to thank you, because I still have arthritis. And this morning, I, I, I had the question I have, actually, is one of the previous lessons, you spoke about the muscles and this back area tightening up. Mm -hmm. and that, would, that happened, and you, and you get like, like you just go like that mm -hmm. and today and the work helped it out but i was curious to know uh, from that area you, you just have to fiddle around and figure out which is going to release it right there's no set thing like the one with the body most, most likely most likely it was a spasm that you experienced that the muscles right. got so yeah, yeah, right. it could be either muscle excessive muscle tension or moving from tension into spasm which we cannot it's like a cramp in our calves that we need to just yeah. let it pass let it go. yeah let it pass but right. positions i like the positional releases and and putting back on slack like with sphinx position might be a good idea yeah, that, that actually helps. So I want to thank you so much because this work is incredible. Sure. Love, love having you here. Thank Marjorie, you. you're next. So when we were doing the, um, you know, both feet on the ground uh, and hands straight, straight up in prayer over your head, mm -hmm. I found that I was exhaling and that my back was actually flattening against the floor, almost as if we were doing like a, you know, my pelvis was tilting up and everything was flattening. I had a consciously arch, like when I was going like this and exhaling, my chest was sinking into the floor and my back was flattening, not arching. The upper back will flatten. Yeah, the top of your shoulders will go into the ground. So, so as you lift, uh, but were you talking about the pelvis? The, the yeah, pelvis I'm saying my pelvis with? was kind of rolling up and my entire back was flattening against the floor, almost Could as be. if we were, I had to consciously go, wait, wait. <laughs> so I didn't understand what. It's, I, it's possible that you were using ground, pressing with your feet into yeah, the I think floor so. in order to send yeah. your hand. Yeah, I would I, I would encourage you to try the same sequence, but with legs long, where you're okay. not pushing. Okay. Although somebody can be stubborn and push with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, once yeah. I thought about it, I was like, well, you know, I sort of uh, kind of got it. But my, I guess my natural. So I'll try with legs long. And then the mm -hmm. other question is, I have a you know a minor spondylolisthesis, and mm -hmm. my toe was tingling a little during this, but. I kind of want to continue. Will you, uh, what can I say, give hints um, in certain movements of where we should try to avoid the lower back and move someplace else so that, because that's I'll sort do, of. I'll do my yeah. best to do the, yeah. to remind, but make the goal for the next 30 days, Marjorie, for you to, to think between your shoulder blades. Okay. Up and back. Especially okay. with, yes, like. Anybody with osteopenia or osteoporosis, when there is excessive roundness, and right. this is an opportunity to bring life there to straighten. And actually, with osteoporosis, there is no fear. Like there is fear with forward bending, forward bending easing, yeah. Cough, yeah. Cough, coughing, bending. Yeah, it's the but, old. You have osteoporosis, don't bend forward, but then you have a spondylolisthesis. <laughs> and go bend forward bend because that's the only. One. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> But but okay. make it make it a journey of not doing. But here's the most important thing, and it's like no matter how many times I'll repeat, and I find it myself too when I do lessons. We overdo. We do too much. We yeah. get ambitious. We get happy when we move more. The moment you think about moving more, you're going to do what we all normally do, yeah. and and make it really a discipline. You studied with us long enough, so I I trust that you'll be able to manage it. Yeah. Yeah. 
that that really this and that's mm -hmm. all yeah this and feel it between your shoulder blades yeah rather than popping right. the pelvis forward yes yeah. okay Great. thanks hanya i'm glad i'm coming after marjorie because when we started the first movement my first tendency was to arc arch all the spine up to I think like the 10th rib mm -hmm. and it it felt very good but then as you started saying more about not moving and I, because I have so much lordosis I start thinking that I should flatten the the lower back and try to make sure that the movement is mostly in the upper back to the extent possible is that something that you would recommend in my case? And of yeah. course, the, the, the flattening of the lower back has to be done with muscles, either with the legs when I had them for, uh, standing or with the abdominals that keep it as flat as possible and then make the movement go mostly in the upper back. Yeah, but I would, I would encourage rather because the moment you try to contract your abdominals, then you say yes and no, and, and that becomes more difficult. Maybe better would be to lie with your knees draped over sofa or, or chair, like the 90, 90 degree position. Having knees closer to your chest will mm -hmm. flatten the pelvis and without with freedom without uh, clenching okay, got it. bracing but, yourself. but what you're saying is that that um strategy of trying not to do too much with the lower back is a good one yes for that i right? would say for 90 percent of people they do too much if you look at the statistics of l4 and l5 this is where most herniated discs are humanity People move too much in that place. And, and, and that's why it's a weak link and it starts to bulge or ooze or tear. So if we learn to redistribute movement throughout more of our spine, but that takes learning what's unfamiliar. Yeah, but in fact, if you think what I have to do in normal life, which is in standing, trying to lift my upper chest, but not the lower one. Mm -hmm. I have to use muscles for that. Correct. So Correct. it might be better if I try to use the muscles also in lying down, wouldn't it be? I think I I've say, improved a lot in any case in all these years, but. I would say mix it. If you want to use some engagement of muscles, fine. If you, when you do something with awareness and you know what you're doing, there's no, no harm in doing anything, really anything. It's only problematic that we adopt something and we just continue persisting on some, some idea. So my only um, argument against holding is that the moment you engage abdominals, then you might stiffen your neck and joy and actually places that, that we want to arch will be held by the pull of abdominals downward. Because abdominals, many of the abdominals, three of them are flexors. So when you flex and extend, it's kind of like saying yes and no, but you could argue that I'm flexing in order not to permit the place where I extend too much, which could be skillful, good action. If you can manage it like this, that's black belt, that's mastery. But okay, most of us, uh, including myself, I would look for positions where it will kind of force me to move in a different place. Okay, great. Nikki, Thank you're you. next. You're welcome. Uh, first, before my question, uh, I'll just say that holding my head up is much easier. Uh, holding I've, head up, great. Yes, I, I've been in kind of layoff mode, recovery mode, and uh, it, this is a great introduction. And I, I really need to strengthen those postural muscles. And this is a great was a great lesson. My question is rather complicated, but um, I recently had an x-ray and uh, they diagnosed me as having severe pectus excavatum. Mm -hmm. And I've never gotten that diagnosis before. And my question to you is, could it possibly be because of the kyphosis from the spinal fractures that they're coming up with this? Could be, perhaps you and I should uh, have an email exchange. Okay. All right. Send send me an email. Great. And, and we'll touch that. Great. Thank you. Ellen, you're next. 
Yes, I have two two questions. One is you're sending the lessons for every day, but would it be advisable to repeat this one? Absolutely. During... If you if you okay. can have time to do that, the okay. more the better. Unless Perfect. it's compulsive and you're punishing yourself and <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, if you have time, great, wonderful, repeat the full lesson. The the 10 minute episodes, um, some of them will be seven minutes, one is 12 minutes or so, but they're around 10 minutes, are based on the movements that we will be exploring in the full lessons. So tomorrow you will see, we'll do some of the movements, the first 10 minutes, then the second day, practically we'll be revisiting what we've done today. But this is for those of you who, who would benefit from a daily short reminder because it's often happened, I hear it every day. People tell me I felt great after the session, but two, three days later, I get again that ache or that pain or my posture right. stops. So, so to, to just paint that neural circuitry over and over with, with simple strokes. Beautiful. If you have time to do more, fantastic. But I understand that many people will be like, whoa, that's already overwhelming. 10 minutes is overwhelming. No one days. Got it. Thank you. And then I had a question initially, like bringing my hands up and then to go to the right, I just kind of moved them like on a right angle and then went up. And then towards the end, it was sort of like, just bring them up and kind of meander, like making it. Second, second choice is better. Second okay, is better. great. And it's easier start, too. And you start right away. It's not like turn like a periscope and then send it up. Okay. But, but at the same time. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so Regina, much. you need to unmute yourself. You yes. You. Thank you. You pronounced my name correctly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is my first introduction to you, and I'm really grateful that I joined, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you so um, much. I have some challenges, so I'm kind of hyper vigilant in some areas, but I really enjoyed this and I appreciate that you gave variations in certain time. The um, curious question, you mentioned hippocampus cons consolidation? Yes. And before that you said a minute to relax, so for hippocampus consolidation and then memory, and I'm thinking, Oh, does that mean is this going to happen subconsciously or, or subconsciously? I, yes, uh, they they did studies that beautiful. after a learning experience, even a short learning experience, if you just stop and try to remove external input, ideally close your eyes, quiet headphones or something, but no music, just quiet, close eyes, quiet, even one minute reinforces learning and what they found is super interesting that that hippocampal activity manifests that it replays backward the event right after we did something so so i use it very often in my fencing training when i have a good bout or good fencing lesson or good movement i lie down close my eyes don't do anything. I don't have to consciously remind yourself. No, just quiet. Fall asleep for one minute. Do nothing. But don't get busy with another impulse. Because during that time, hippocampus is replaying that just uh, the learning hap that happened just a moment ago backwards. At night, when we sleep, our hippocampus replays the whole event forward again of all events, everything that happened today. And things that we, because that's how learning goes. If that pruning happens every day, every day, every day, the new habit is being formed. Because hippocampus, when something happens just one time, nice, but it's gonna be washed over because there it must have been not important if it just happened once. But the things that, perpetuate, perpetuate, get solidified. So yeah, thank you. I, I'm glad I asked because after I heard Mammy, I said, oh, we're supposed to remember and play it in our mind. So I started doing that. So that's exactly you do, what You don't I'm need to. to. <laughs> that's, <laughs> called, that's called visualization. It right. also plays a role. It also is important, but, but this particular uh, strategy is just quiet. 
Nothing. Go now. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Appreciate NC. it. Uh, I know someone who's in there close to 50 and she just had her atlas and axis fused. Mm -hmm. What effect is that going to have on the rest of her spine? Well, atlas and axis, there is a place of huge amount of rotation. 50% of our rotation of our turning occurs C1 or on C2. So obviously this will impact how she turns. But luckily, there is so much redundancy in our system that she will learn how to move in C3, in C4, in C5, and so on. And if she can learn how to maximize movement throughout, again, distributed evenly, that doesn't necessarily mean that her C3 and C4 will have to be overburdened and get into problems later on. So... So motivation to keep turning in places, of course, whenever her doctor gives her green light to start therapy, to start movement after fusion, uh, because obviously we don't want to move the fused parts, right? They should be fused, but, but our, our structure is genius. It's brilliant. You cut something out, you fuse something out, something else can take over. Thank you. Great. Judy. And then we'll have three more, Judy, Lila, and okay. Mary. Is it common to get a couple of related questions? Is it common to get osteoporosis in your L4 and L5? Because I, I know I have it on a couple of vertebrae, but I don't, I don't remember it, what's L1 and L2. Uh, typically, the also, vulnerable places are, are thoracic spine and, and, and hips. Because typically when you have bone density scans, they include wrists, they include hip, and they include spine. But I'm saying, I know I have it in the L's. I just don't remember with L2 and L3 or L4 and L5. Mm. But anyway, you were saying about L4 and L5 being very weak in everybody and you have to redistribute it. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, actually, they're quite strong. They're biggest vertebra, but the loads are huge. So, so they're, they're overused. They're not necessarily weak. I mean, they get weaker. If you, if you start to move something over and over and over and over and over, you can break even metal, right? By bending it, bending it, bending it, bending it. So, so they are not inherently weak. It's just that movement patterns habitual movement patterns that force excessive movement makes tissues break. Then so how do you make it more evenly distributed? With what we just did. Okay. With what we just did. With, less, with learning how to go beyond our habits. First, recognizing. Because first of all, most people on this planet have no idea where in their spine they're bending backward. What do you mean? Where? Everywhere. I don't feel it. So most people have no idea. Second, even when they become aware of what they're doing, they would tell you, isn't that what everybody does? Like how else could you bend, right? But just like with fingerprints, there are no two exactly the same. That's with our movement. There are no two people in this room or in this city that will do movements like lifting the head exactly the same. And therefore, our job is to first become aware of what we're doing and then introduce new novelty, new places so you can start moving in the places that previously lay dormant. And then you leave your body so to do the healing. You that's unload. The part. <laughs> that's the hardest part, redistributing it. Yeah. Because we're so used to having you. Yeah, of course, of course. That's, that's, that's why when you were a child, you were doing thousands of millions of movements this way, that way. You were doing silly movements. You were hanging upside down like a bat. You were lying on the stomach, on the side, sitting on the sofa backwards with feet up. This was beautiful. Unfortunately, when we become adult, our movement menu narrows and we start to rely only on the same old, same old. Great, Lila. Next. Thank you. You're welcome, Judy. 
Okay, I hope you, you can hear me well because uh, I'm still I... rejoining lying down on the floor on the side and changing side to side without pain. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was great. You know, I forgot how how wonderful is this lesson and how much can I acquire by doing it very tiny and everything millimetrical changes. That's and, right. And uh, well, the the effect is fantastic. But then I said, well, I feel great. I'm going to explore. I, I explore a lot um, how lessons can be adapted using the floor and the wall instead mm -hmm. of, for instance, the effort of being standing on the knee, you know, on the knees and try and keep the balance. And I said, okay, I want, I want to see what can I do with the wall on the back and what can I do with the wall on the side? And mm -hmm. voila, I discover, I mean, it's a little tricky because you have to understand what you're doing with your spine, maintaining some alignment, call it like that, I don't know, if that, a good organization, you know? And I put the, the knee uh, that is supposed to be on the floor, you know, against the wall. And then mm -hmm. I put the food that is supposed to be on the floor against the wall, like mm -hmm. I'm standing. And, uh -huh. and I did the, the, the variations. Um, you know, first I put the food that is on, the food that was standing on the leg that is on the floor. Mm -hmm. And that was very efficient to uh -huh. do the lesson. You know, then I tried the other variation, the reverse, no? The, Excellent. The... Excellent. That's one. One of the principles of this method is to increase the richness and being creative like you after finishing Feldenkrais training, you have so many tools, you, 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 beautiful, wonderful. It was, I don't want to get up. I, I'm so relaxed and my body finally is a whole piece because I had been, I have a lot of issues and a lot of pains here and there and the pains are gone. I'm afraid even to stand up, but it's going to be good. Great. Thank you, Mary. Super. It Thank you, Lila. Beautiful. Okay, Mary, you're the last person. And then I will answer Kelly. I'll try to answer Kelly. I'll be quick. I just want to note how striking to me it was that my breathing slowed and mirrored the movements. So uh -huh. it goes to your point that everything is connected. That's right. That's right. There is no... There is no posture without balance, without breathing, without... And I wasn't thinking about it, but I notice it slowed. And when you send us the lesson for homework, will you visually demonstrate what we're supposed to do? I am, I am with you. I'm with you doing it. Actually, I did the 30 day myself. So Okay. Thank you. Good to be back. Thank you. All right. Good to have you back. Okay. Let's try Kelly with without camera. Just unmute yourself. I see you wrote the question i'll read it now but maybe you can tell me yes um it's better a little keep going okay um i just wanted to make certain and uh, we we're in the midst of the lesson i thought you said that um it was easier sitting than on the floor the lesson or maybe all or just this one and i i may just be more oriented towards the floor um, and that's how I started taking Feldenkrais lessons. Um, but I find it easier on the floor and the opposite. And I just want to make, I'm just trying to understand my experience. Uh -huh. Is that uh, what you said? Um, because we you're comparing both sitting okay. positions only. You're not talking about doing the movements lying down, right? You're comparing sitting on the floor versus sitting on the chair and you finding that sitting on the floor is easier than on the chair for you, correct? Well, uh, no, I, what I'm, I understood, I thought maybe I got confused in, in lesson, um, but um, I thought we were, you, we usually have the option to do it laying on the floor or in a chair, the, mm -hmm. the lessons. And um, I find the lessons easier on the floor and is it typically easier in a chair? No, no. When you do, when you accommodate, some, sometimes when person has difficulty lying on the floor, they choose to lie on the recliner or something. But these are unique, unique situations. On the floor will be much easier to do the movements than, than sitting on the chair or in a reclined position. It's only for those okay. people who have, who have absolutely a no-no. Some people even sleep on recliners because they cannot sleep on the flat bed. 
So for, for those individuals, we encourage them to, to do their lessons on the chair. But what I said was sitting with crossed legs on the floor for many Westerners is difficult sitting on the chair, we are more used to. So some people will, will be better off doing the movements that are designed to do with sitting cross-legged, sitting on the chair. Okay, thank you. Super, the very lesson. good. Thank you. And then, yeah, thank you. Super, all right.